right? So here we are, the 12th of May. It's, it's, yep. it's, it's almost sunny outside. Is it, is it nice where you yeah, are it's, down? It's cold. I, uh, oh, yeah. It's probably yeah. 20 below where you are because you're up near, what, Churchill, Manitoba. It's, uh, uh, it's about two degrees here. Oh, we've got, uh, we've got two degrees here as well. So. Oh, okay. A couple of quick things. Um, I, I texted with Terry DeMonte this morning. He's going to be joining us. Yes, you told me. In a couple we of weeks. A, we've got a date. And I mentioned, not, not yet, but I mentioned that simply because we're getting guest suggestions from some of our viewers. And please know that we are keeping track of those and adding them to the list. And I'm only mentioning those in my postings that I have confirmed with or who will be confirming with us in the coming days. So oh, Terry excellent. is the latest to be added to the, um, to the list. I would like you to see Sourdough 2.0 that came out of the oven this wow. morning. Yeah, I'm Much so better. pleased. Much better. Much better than the one that looked like a hat. Um, yeah, so you you got a bicycle pump and... That's that's an idea. Let me write that one down. Well, I'm a baking fiend. And you uh, you certainly are. And I just want to give you another quick little note of uh, a product that I've been trying this week that is outstanding. It is crunchy, spicy peanut butter made in Montreal Manba. by a company by a company called Manba. I know this is probably not up your Billy Wick Alley thing. It's very expensive. It is, but it's, um, there's nothing terribly new or original about putting spices in, in nut butters, but uh, they do a very good job. Just a touch of cane sugar and some, uh, some hot pepper, and it's absolutely delicious. I got it from Lufa, and uh, the day it arrived, I was making dumplings, and it went with the dumplings, oh, like you would not believe. So it these is. These are the Lufa dumplings? No, no, no. These I made my own. Mm. I make my own, but I added the, uh, I took a spoonful of the manda on top of that, and man, oh man, it was just delicious. So that's uh, my do you food like note. Really, really hot. Well, I know you. I know that. Uh, I know that that the black pepper that you get at Tim Hortons makes you makes you cry. <laughs> But, no, no, uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm middling, but, <laughs> you? but you're insane, right? You just no, 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 I don't like the burn. The, balls no, no, I don't like the burn the roof of your mouth thing. I like things, I like a bit of heat. And uh, if you like a bit of heat, they also, Manba, M-A-N-B-A dot C-A, also make a, a creamy uh, almond butter that is uh, spicy. Oh, and, uh, my wife likes almond butter a lot. It's delicious. And they have, there are, some, peanut butter. there are some Haitian roots in there too, in the company and in the way they prepare these things, so. Highly recommended. Let us get to our guest, Russell Copeman, okay. who is uh, standing by in the green room. Russell, as he signs on here, I will introduce him. He's worked with Alliance Quebec. He was been in, uh, he was an MNA. He was VP Concordia, part of the Montreal Executive Committee, uh, and currently Executive Director of the Quebec English School Boards Association. And there he is, Russell. How are you? Good, Good morning, morning, you guys. Very well. How are you? Uh, we're just fine. It's good to see you. Uh, what was this about you needing a haircut? I think you look pretty good. There's no problem this morning. Look, if that's my biggest uh, COVID-19 pandemic problem, um, okay. we're, we're doing okay. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I got gotcha. you. The family's morning, well. Russell. Everyone is well. Excellent. Okay, where do we begin? Uh, kids going back to school this week. Um, where would you like to start? What is your view on, on, first of all, I'm taking this from the perspective of what we're seeing this morning, and that is the fact that many are suggesting that déconfinement is going too quickly. What is your view on that? So the organization I work for um, has had s serious reservations about the um, reopening of schools. Um, I guess based on two uh, you know, two issues. One is sort of operational, uh, and that's what we're seeing outside the CMM when schools opened on the 11th, which is to say, you know, are the necessary conditions in place for a safe uh, and secure reopening of schools? Um, and, and second is, the, I would say, the more uh, serious issue of whether it's appropriate to open schools originally on the 19th of February within the, the CMM, and now the 25th, uh, 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 pardon me, the 19th of May, 
in the CMM, and now the 25th of May, given the state of the pandemic on the island of Montreal, right? I think increasingly uh, governments are saying, uh, people are saying the pandemic is not under control in Montreal. And uh, the, you know that was our concern from the very beginning, was that this announcement was premature and uh, that the situation didn't, uh, didn't permit a safe and secure return to school for, for uh, students, staff, and their families. Alison Haynes in the Gazette this morning, uh, Russell contended that it is a case of two solitudes, that it has become politicized, that the pandemic is virtually non-existent outside Montreal, but is a problem in Montreal. And that's a problem for a CAC government. It's an inconvenience politically. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think clearly the, the, the cases of the pandemic, uh, the uh, rates of hospitalization and deaths uh, are concentrated in the greater Montreal area. But we've seen in, the, you know, in other countries where the, the numbers dropped or have dropped in various regions, there's a risk of a resurgence when you begin to lift these uh, social uh, restrictions. And so although the numbers are small outside of the greater Montreal area, there are still active cases of COVID-19 in every region of the province, with the exception perhaps of the Magdalen Islands, where I think they have had not a single case. And so there, you know, there, is a, there is a risk of community transmission. It's much lower outside Montreal, but there's still a risk. And so, you know, I think while the, the, the crux of the problem is indeed the island of Montreal or greater Montreal, um, e e even school board chairs outside the greater Montreal area have concerns about reopening schools at this time. Yeah. Well, Montreal is, is number like five. Sorry, Ivan, I'm sorry, ahead. Montreal's number five in the world now per capita in terms of the number of cases. And I was speaking with my spouse just two minutes ago, and she's hearing people from the island now. The scuttlebutt is this morning that they're going to shut down the island and start really closing in on things now, and they're going to be reacting quite quickly. Have you heard anything to that effect? Look, all I, you know, all I do is, I, like, like many of us, I sort of have become glued to my uh, TV set at one o'clock when uh, Mr. Legault and or a government representative and Dr. Arruda make their, you know, have their daily press uh, conferences. It was pretty clear yesterday that, you know, the premier was signaling that he's increasingly concerned about the situation in Montreal and that the, a return to these travel restrictions is not impossible, right? Um, we, have a, we have a secondary residence in saint agathe de mont uh, we did not travel there during the period where these travel restrictions existed because they existed just about north of St. Jerome or around St. Jerome, they came into effect. Um, we returned to our cottage this past weekend, but we were, I think, uh, very, very responsible in the sense that we brought all our food with us. We, uh, you know, I put gas in the, I put gas in the car, uh, at the pump and paid at the pump using a glove. I mean, so, you know, as long, I think Dr. Ruda was saying yesterday, as, as long as people behave responsibly uh, from Montreal when they travel to other regions, that that, you know, so far is all right. But I think there is a risk because there's political pressure primarily uh, from within a CEQ caucus that is dominated by the regions to, uh, to restore some of these travel restrictions, uh, which, you know, I'm not sure is necessary in a public health standpoint, but, you know, uh, clearly would be, would be, I, I think, unfortunate. If people, re if people are, are reacting responsibly, such as we did on the weekend, the risk of transmission, from, you know, into the regions is, is virtually nil, very low. Okay, so again, it's political rather than logistical. Look, uh, I think... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks uh, an increase in the politicization of some of these public health decisions, and that is of great concern both to me personally and to my to the organization that I work for. You know, when the I would say at the beginning of the pandemic, we were 
confident that when Dr. Arruda spoke on behalf of, the, of Quebec Public Health, he was speaking based on science, on epidemiology, and, you know, and, and health and best practices. We've seen some decisions recently that certainly call that into question for me. You know, an example is the shift in the risk factor from 60 to 70 for people working in, in schools, which happened literally overnight, right? Mm -hmm. Up until a week ago Thursday, the government of Quebec's own documents said people who are over 60 should not return to school, 60 and over. And all of a sudden, last Tuesday, a week ago today, the deputy premier went on the, the television and said, no, 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 that, that, that uh, cutoff is now 70 plus. And all she said was, we've got to go ahead from public health. Well, you know, uh, uh, the World Health Organization continues to talk about 60 plus. The Center for Disease Control talks about 65 plus. All of a sudden, Quebec is talking about 70 plus. I know we're a distinct society, but I think COVID-19 acts act pretty much around the world. Um, with all due respect to you as a former city councillor with the Kader team and to uh, Madame Plant, uh, there seems to be, the administration is one step behind here all the time. It's they don't want to push too hard and they don't want to impose um, uh, masks for public transit and all of that. That's been the problem since the beginning, has it not? I, I realize you have to tread carefully here, but... Uh, well, I mean, not particularly, um, you know, I've been, um, uh, I've, I was forcibly re relieved of my responsibilities with the city of Montreal in November of 2017. Right. So <laughs> I'm, just a, I'm just a private citizen now. Okay, I understand. Um, but Yeah, no, but I mean. Um, but the city has been poorly administered for decades. And again, with due respect to Kadair and Plant, and they've been trying very hard, but it's been a mess now. We have met the enemy. The enemy is us. And it's not just the CHSLDs. It's the entire Metro Montreal um, narrative that needs to be fixed here, isn't it? Um, I think that's an element. You, uh, um, you know, I... I tend to follow more closely what Dr. Mylène Drouin, who is the head of the Montreal Public Health Agency says. Yeah. Any, any elected official um, is going to, of course, take into account political considerations. Mm. And I guess my point is that the public health people are supposed to be immune from, the, from those political considerations and therefore on matters of public health and how to deal with, with COVID-19, the pandemic, and whether one should wear a mask or not wear a mask, I'm more inclined to, to try and read the tea leaves of the public health officials than I am of the elected officials. Right, okay. But what about the kids in the schools? Because uh, Russell, that's really when it went off the rails for me. I've got two young grandchildren. So I'm talking about daycares and your bailiwick schools and that, you know, being politicized, if you will, the way we, the three of us have been talking, seems particularly egregious to me. I mean, what are we doing? We put them in a Petri dish? Yeah, so that's, you know, been one of our primary concerns, concerns Dave, is that, um, you know, n n n virtually no other ju jurisdiction in Canada is moving this fast on opening schools. Virtually none. British Columbia is making timid, uh, movements towards opening schools in certain areas. Other provinces, I think in the Maritimes, there's at least one province, I think perhaps even two, who've reported like zero new cases of COVID-19 in the past couple of days, and their schools remain closed. It is a bit mystifying to me why, as the epicenter of the pandemic in Canada, with 23% of the Canadian pop population, but over 50% of cases, over 50% of hospitalizations, and over 50% of deaths, why, would, why we would be moving so fast on reopening schools. I, 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 it, it is mystifying. It's a huge concern. Um, and, you know, uh, I think every parent has to examine very, very carefully 
uh, whether or not they, they choose to, to return their children to school. And I know that puts parents in a difficult situation because with the opening of the economy, there's some pressure on them to return to work. And with the associated pressure of return to work comes, what do I do with my kids, right? Um, so that's a, that's a real issue. There's no doubt about it. And, and how do you see it working uh, anyway, completely apart from public health, which I wouldn't want to separate anyway with two young grandchildren, but uh, you know, the kids have got to be far enough apart. You're not going to get them all back anyway. You're going to have a class, a full class is going to maybe 12 kids. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the other concern is, you know, what is the, what is the educational or pedagogical value of returning to school under these circumstances, right? And I think that's far from clear. There, there are social benefits. We know that. Dr. Ruda has talked about, you know, um, that in fact schools are generally speaking safe environments and that some children may not be in a safe environment at home. He's alluded to that. I think that's kind of um, disingenuous as an argument. If, if a child is not safe at home, then you call youth protection, right? There's other ways of dealing with it. You don't take a child out of a difficult situation in their home environment and send them to school to correct that, that's not a solution. So if you just look, and yes, there's some socialization benefits to seeing others and being in a classroom, et cetera. But when you look at the limits that are imposed on the back to school, the, you know, the this, this school doesn't look at all resemble, uh, you know, resemble what it was previously. The classroom may not look like what it was previously. As you say, in our schools, it's somewhere between eight and 12 students which means if there's more than eight or 12 students that are returning to, to class, they don't have the same teacher, they're not in the same classroom, in some instances, they're not in the same school, right? Their desks are six, uh, six feet apart, two meters, they have to eat at their desk, they can't go to the cafeteria, they can't go to the library, uh, there's no phys ed class per se, you can go outside for recess, but you have to keep your groups distinct. You know, I, 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 and with more than half of the student population absent, there's the whole issue, issue of equity. What are these young people learning that the students at home may not be learning, right? So, which is why initially the government kept saying, we're gonna, if, if we go back to school, we're gonna concentrate on revision and you know, going over material that's learned, not trying to teach new material and, and complete the year because half the students aren't there. And you've got the, you, uh, Russell, you've got them going back in, in, at the end of May, and my God, Johnny Batiste weekend, they're finished. What's the point? Right. So, right. So is you know even finally, uh, Education Minister Robert alluded to that when he went on to Le Monde en Parle on Sunday night, where he said, "Look, the 25th of May, ça vaut la peine, but uh, if it's put off to the 1st of June, maybe not, right? Because there'd only be three weeks left." So, uh, as I say. Um, you know, I think a number of people who work in, in the educational field have serious misgivings about this. Um, uh, our school boards, chairs, the elected officials have serious misgivings. Um, you know, we put up some uh, response when the government said, you're going to open on this date. The position of my organization is that school boards locally have to determine the conditions under which schools are reopened and whether it's safe and secure for the students, their staff and their families. And frankly, that school boards reserve the right to not open schools either on the 11th or on the 25th if their reading of the local situation is such that it's not safe and secure. Okay, God, we could go on for a long time. Russell, um, je t'entends en français aussi, tu, tu, tu fais une bonne job en français, mon ami. Ben, C'est gentil. Um, Après euh, 14 ans à l'Assemblée nationale euh, et 4 ans à la Ville de Montréal euh, et, et avoir replongé dans le français euh, depuis, euh, depuis mon engagement à l'Association des commissions scolaires anglophones du Québec, on se débrouille. Euh, mmh. C'est fort. C'est très fort. Quand fois, je t'entends, tu oui. euh, as des bonnes pratiques de communication, ton message est clair et puis oui. bravo, mon ami, ça fonctionne très bien. C'est beaucoup d'années d'expérience yeah. uh, et de pratique. Uh, that's what I was telling Dave yesterday. It's last time I school. saw you, I think you were 12, I think, the last time I saw you. <laughs> and there's been a lot of water. Much. 
a lot of water under the bridge since then, man. You've done a lot. Um, anyway, just to get back to the personal things, the family is well and you're well and uh, yes, managing, um, managing okay you know, at home. Everything is good. Uh, I think you know everyone is finding this confinement a bit challenging. Um, uh, we have one adult daughter living with us. Um, she had moved out and has moved back. She's uh, she'll be uh, she'll be 25 very soon. And wow. uh, if, if you've experienced an adult child leaving and then coming back, there's challenges there, right? It's <laughs> it's not easy for anyone. Yeah. Not easy for her. It's not easy for us. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we're 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 all in good shape, very healthy. Uh, concerned about my mother-in-law, who's sort of our last close relation, who is uh, in their 80s, and you know the situation uh, with, of course, uh, COVID-19 and 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 people in that age group. Um, you know, we know about a dozen, I would say, 10 to 12 people personally, Yvonne, who have had COVID-19. Uh, we know of a few fatalities. They they have been yeah. in. With, with people older, but this this is a nasty bug, you know. Um, uh, I know of a, of a couple in their mid 60s who were very very seriously ill. Thankfully, they didn't require hospitalization, but they were out a long time. And I was just reading about Dennis Brock's experience, yeah. right, with uh, yeah. with COVID 19. He's not 90. Um, I think he's in his by his own admission in his late 60s. 45 days in the ICU and. 38 days on a respirator. I mean, you know, that's yeah. practically a miraculous recovery. Wow. So this is an yeah, Russell, I gather you know the the example of the former Canadians hockey player uh, Georges Larac. I mean, here was a very healthy, strong, athletic, well-built man. He said he never had f suffered such pain in his life. This guy was a hockey player. Yeah. Look, I mean, you know, the 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 people who suggested at the beginning of all of this uh, sort of tend to be called COVID, idi COVID idiots now, that this is merely the flu. I mean, you know, unfortunate, unfortunately, science and, and health, you know, uh, has proven them very, very wrong. Uh, it's much more fatal. And uh, even in young people, kind of, if you're unlucky, um, it can have some terrible, terrible consequences, right? Just awful. Yeah. I mean, Lorac said he, you know, the, the, the hardest thing he had to do was get up and go to his own washroom in the hospital. He was in ICU. It's a nasty bug. And um, I think the realization, you know, is hitting people that, um, that this is going to go on for some time. Uh, I, I put up on a Facebook post uh, on my own page on Saturday. I think the government messaging around this has worked so well. Uh, in terms of stay home and isolate and wash your hands, that we've all become terrified of catching COVID-19. And we've lost sight that all of these mitigation measures, all of these restrictions, were not designed to prevent people from getting to COVID-19. It was designed to flatten the curve, right? It was designed to try and make sure that not all of us got it at the same time, overwhelming our healthcare system. But you know, we I regularly hear from friends and 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 family members that they don't want any return to <laughs> to a normal life as long as this thing is out there. No, that's, well, that's exactly it. I fear for Montreal now because uh, if there's any backsliding, we're going to be in serious trouble. Uh, you know, I think one of two things has to happen, right? Uh, we have to have a broadly available vaccine, uh, and it's you know, it's not just an announcement that a vaccine is, is been, has been found and tested, you know, you need hundreds of millions of doses, right? And you don't manufacture that overnight. So the, the, the broad availability of a, of a vaccine from the time it's discovered and tested is probably a year. Um, or this thing needs to go away the way SARS did, inexplicably, right? Uh, and uh, nothing seems to indicate that that's that's going to happen, but we do forget that SARS just just disappeared. You know, there was there was just, no vaccine was found, no treatment was found. It just stopped. I think the the depth of community transmission and the virulence of this uh, coronavirus would seem to indicate that that's it's not going to go away of its own accord. But we don't know what we don't know. So as far as we know, we stay home and stay safe, right? Do you have a personal routine during the day, Russell? 
that you try to uh, adhere to? Because uh, I'm told by public health officials too that that is crucial. Yeah, you know, so I, I think like many of us during the beginning of this sort of period of confinement, it, I was almost treating this as a, as a, as a forced holiday, right? The, 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 I think the first week it was kind of, well, we can sleep in, we can stay up late, we can do, it kind of felt like, um, you know, the Christmas holidays. You get, into a, you get into a whole different rhythm. We're watching TV until 12, 1 in the morning and we're sleeping in. But, you know, shortly thereafter, when, when we realized how long this was going to go on, uh, I felt it important to repose a, 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 more, um, a more weekday environment for sure. Although I'm working, you know, uh, from home, like many of us, uh, I still try and keep sort of regular hours and, you know, do all of that. Um, but also, uh, I, I have found, you know, going out for a long walk is really, really important. Um, I, I don't exercise that regularly, but we've made a very conscious effort to try and go for an hour's walk a day to, and, and, and you know, to get some fresh air, get some exercise and try not to use this as much as we have been, yeah. which is, you know, in my view, almost one of the worst inventions in the 21st century. What's the, What's the name of your dog, Russell? Uh, my dog? Did you not have, did I see a picture of you with a dog on, on Facebook? No? Oh, you, uh, yes, you saw or, a picture. Or you were a petting a stranger's, dog. oh, you're petting a stranger's dog, I see. No, okay. not a stranger, Eva. <laughs> I was petting a good friend's dog who lives in the town of Montreal West, yes. okay. whose name is Sparky. Sparky, there we go. Okay. Montreal yes. West, Sparky? Yes. Yeah, that yeah. pretty well goes together. Yeah. 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 That's your nickname, isn't Sparky. it, Don? Sparky? Sparky. Yeah. Oh, God. Russell, That's we're. everyone's name in Montreal West, right, Russell? Yeah. Russell, we're, just, out of, we're out of time. I, 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 I wouldn't know about that. Yeah. It was. A, <laughs> It was a delight to see you again, my friend. Stay well and all the best to the family and everything else. And Thank uh, you. you. And to you, Yvonne. It was great to see you. It's, it's been a little while. and It's uh, been a long time. Your hair is a little shorter than the last time I saw you. Hey, listen, you'd look good with the chrome dome, buddy. Yeah, I'm not no, so sure. I, no, I think it's no? doing fine just as it is. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Dave, it's uh, great to see you. Um, uh, our, as you know, of course, our, our sons, our, our, uh, our, our friends are quite friends. close and uh, it was great to see, uh, it was great to see uh, Jeff at, the, at Rami's wedding and, and participating in all of that. So uh, yeah. it's, it's great to talk to both of you. Very good, really buddy. Good to talk to you. Say hi to your son for me. I, I usually talk to Romney on Facebook. So I'd keep up right. the good fight, Russell. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks see very you. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Bye. I didn't know that uh, that sons were friends. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, uh, Romney and Jeff are very close friends. Oh, They've known each other, I think, since Royal West Academy. Yeah, since high school. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess these discussions take place every day in family circles and elsewhere, and they could go on and on and on. But uh, it's one day at a time, and uh, yeah. try to be responsible. And um, and I think Russell makes a good point about the phone too. Uh, I know you have to do a lot of this for your for your your work. Yeah. Uh, I don't anymore, and I'm finding I can't turn on that TV set every night or or every afternoon to watch. Oh no! But here it's here it's been regimented here too. Now it is it is shut off at certain times of the day and then certain periods. And uh, yeah, we have our own little regimen here too. Yeah, because uh, I find it I find it enervating rather than informative. Absolutely. You know? Which Absolutely. And then you long. dive into all the numbers and this and that and everything and you extrapolate and it, it gets larger in your brain than what the facts one step at a time are, right? I'm not yeah. expressing this. Or as moment. you say, we don't know what we don't know. And right. I think exactly. that frustrates us and, yep. it, and, it, and it, it feeds that need to know something. Exactly. And it's very frustrating. Tomorrow. I've got somebody with me, so I'm Good there. You're going to fly tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to be doing yoga with Daniel Beliveau. Oh, right, 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 right. Daniel right. with the Pilates et Plus Center up here in the stash. And uh, they have they do physio. Of course, there's nobody there these days. Daniel is doing uh, courses on YouTube. But uh, we'll get into some yoga talk tomorrow. And I will demonstrate my daily yoga routine nothing. live, 
while we're doing one of those unitards. Are you? No, no, no. But I'll be I'll be doing yoga while we interview Danielle. So that's something to look forward to tomorrow. Okay. Well, I uh, I've got to go to Toronto tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I'm <Sure>. flying. <laughs> You're flying to Toronto. <laughs> oh yeah, no plane, but I'm I'm flying. Okay, tomorrow, the <laughs> Oh God. <laughs> <laughs>